All right, we are back on another episode of Rise and Pod, and this is Athlete to Athlete with the Allison Scuds. Allie, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me and uh, Rari here. Is it? It's Arari. That's what I was going to ask. What our special guest name Rari, is? Rari. R A R I. Ah, Rari. I love it. I love it. How old is Rari? She's seven now. So, so she's still been. A young she's, gun. She's, she's but been she's been with you through some thick and thin. Yeah, that's right. She has. All the way back in Miami, then out to California, and now she's in Vegas. So, she's oh my been goodness, quite the, quite the traveler. I love it, and and you are already touching on one of my questions about you being just a move around all the place, young lady, hard to keep up with. You have had some pretty interesting and awesome travels throughout your career as an athlete, but let's kind of go back a little bit to the origins of when you started in the competitive space. I, I think your first year competing was 2014. Is that correct? 2015 technically yeah okay 2015 yeah. technically you might have had an open score then in there in 2014 or something that's where i'm getting that data from probably in my mind oh uh, yes the open the open yeah i did the open see the open counts ali don't dismiss yes, the open okay right. it does count right. kind of but so all the way back in 2014 how long have you been doing crossfit before you actually started participating in something like the open or even thrown down I think I started uh, about a year before that. So right around the open um, in 2013, I believe it was, was when I went to go watch Wadapalooza for the first time. I hadn't done CrossFit, hadn't even really heard of CrossFit. And um, I was friends with Dylan Malitsky in school and he was like, oh, come check this out. And it was love at first sight. I saw the competition and had just recently retired from competitive all-star cheerleading. And so was kind of missing that you know, competitive aspect and training environment. And yeah, I knew from right when I was watching the competition that I was like, yep, I want to do that competitively. And it, it's kind of started from there. That's amazing. Yeah, that was going to be my immediate follow up was okay. So you weren't doing CrossFit yet. But all of a sudden, you find yourself at the fitness festival, Wadapalooza mm -hmm. to spectate. So I knew that makes sense, though, you were connected with Dylan. He, he persuaded you to, to come through and, and become a fan and fall in love immediately. That's really exactly. cool. And, yeah. and of course, you and I are most familiar with one another through a relationship from Brute Strength um, where you were being coached. When did you initially start your relationship with Brute? Remind me on when you started I getting started coaching. right after 2018 regionals. So I was with my uh, initial coach, Peter Kazanis, um, basically from the start of my competitive career, you know, when I started taking it more seriously, we did a team together in 2015 regionals. And then I kind of knew from there I was going to qualify probably the next year as an individual. So he started kind of taking me under his wing and he coached me um, through the 2018 regionals. And then that's when I uh, decided to make a change and uh, started working with Nick Fowler. I love it. I love it. And you, so when you started getting receiving coaching in general, was he just at the gym, Peter? Was he at the gym that you yeah. were training at or how did that relationship begin? Yeah, well, it began because we started training together um, on the regionals team. And he is kind of like, you know, the OG of the OG has had previously owned an affiliate before that had competed, I believe, as an individual and on multiple different teams at regionals up to that point. And we were kind of putting together a not super competitive, but, you know, a somewhat competitive team back then. And um, so he ended up coming over and we, we made a team that went to regionals and we just, you know, connected and became training partners, friends. And then um, he had a lot of coaching experience already. And so it was just kind of like a natural thing that happened. It was like, yep, you're going to coach me. It was never like, yeah, it just kind of happened. So I love it. So it was super organic, of course. Yeah, and then you make course. the transition. Um, <laughs> and, and how many years had you made it to regionals with Peter as your coach? 16, 17, and 18. So three wow. years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what made you through those experiences? I mean, you're out there throwing down on the floor. You're already at a level mm -hmm. now where a lot of athletes aspire to be one day. What made you want to make the transition then to brood and potentially and, and start your, your journey with Nick Fowler? It just kind of felt like the next evolution of training. Nick obviously had a lot of experience with really high level games athletes. And that's kind of the, you know, what I was trying to do and go after. And at the same time, Peter was having a lot of, um, he was starting a family and, and having just more things on his plate as well. And um, we're still good friends. Actually, we've just been texting back and forth this whole weekend about like, you know, the, the, all the stuff going down at semifinals. And um, he was such a, 
powerful mentor and just like foundational, like taught me so much at the beginning. Um, but it just felt like it was kind of time for some new eyes and maybe like something different to try out. And on top of that, I had a pretty bad experience at 2018 regionals. I just like physically and mentally, like I felt really good going in, but I had performed uh, surprisingly well in 2017. And I Mm -hmm. think that I, you know, I got seventh place and I was like, oh, okay, well, like next year I'm obviously going to qualify and just kind of really put that pressure on myself. And it was the first time that I'd felt that in this kind of setting. And so it was just kind of like the perfect storm, right? Like first couple workouts were complete opposite wheelhouse workouts, Linda and triple three. And it was just like all down there from the all downhill from there. You know, I'd put a lot of this pressure on myself and mentally just kind of crumbled and physically, you know, those things always go hand in hand. And it was, it was a big wake up call. I was like, okay, I got to be doing something different, try to figure out like how I can fill these holes. How can I get on a better path mentally too? And so it was, that was kind of, I feel like the crux of my career so far. Um, just like a big turning point. Yeah. And I can imagine that. I mean, it's important for us to really be honest about where our sport is too. And it's just mm-hmm. not, it's, it's not as simple as many others where people often assume, and we can assume the same and build these expectations around this as athletes, even as coaches, um, that it's linear, right? Where it's like, Hey, I got seventh, you know what I'm coming mm-hmm. to do next year, right? I'm yeah. coming for that fourth. I'm coming for that podium. Um, and, and, and of course, and those are, those point, are, it had been, you know, in my career, like every year, I got better in the open every year I got better at regionals. And so it was just like, and I had an experience. I think every athlete needs to experience that moment, that Oh shit moment where you're like, Oh, it's, it's actually not linear and, and have that, that wake up call really. And so, although it was, you know, probably one of the most painful parts of my career mentally, like it was, I needed it to happen. And I feel like it was a huge stepping stone for where I be like the athlete I've become today. And, and I love that. And I, and I think you're right. I think it, whether we, we like it or not, every, everybody experiences that particularly in our sport. And we've seen it uh, for all the way from the top down to the bottom of those that do eventually get an opportunity to punch their ticket to the CrossFit Games and make it to the big show. Um, and for you making that choice to, to then partner up with Nick Fowler, to be onboarded, to really critique probably yourself in a performance way that potentially you'd never really explored before, right? You're getting mm-hmm. new analytics, um, of course, Nick's got his own philosophy. What then was that transition like from coach to coach? I'd say it was pretty smooth. You know, I, I was kind of, you know, shopping around, if you will, just kind of seeing what my options were. And I got linked up with Nick through Mike Caju and um, just came out that summer for they were doing a training camp um, before the games. So Hinshaw was out, Nick Sorrell was out, like everybody was, all those like specialists were out and you were there obviously. And like, we had a whole crew there that was, it just felt like, so like what I needed, I had obviously been training near and around Noah, um, which was an extremely high level, awesome athlete to be around. But I just felt like I needed that guidance from somebody who not only had those uh, connections to other specialists, but also, you know, knew kind of what it, would take to get to that level. Um, but anyway, so sorry, that was kind of a roundabout. No, that was great. The, um, yeah, I just came out to check it out. We we really clicked and I really, um, you know, admire Nick and and we got along really well. And so I was like, yeah, it's no brainer. I love it. And then of course you, you were with Brute. Was it, how many seasons ha- were you with Nick? Um, 19, 20 and, and 21. So okay. Years. So three three seasons. You probably learned a lot of things about yourself, particularly as an athlete, about what you preferred, what you didn't prefer, where your strengths and weaknesses were continuing to tie into the test. That ultimately, for us as athletes um, in this sport, is evolving constantly. Right? Yeah. We don't even uh, necessarily have a thumb down on how we qualify for the games every year because we know they serve us up with something different at least every two years to keep yeah. us on our toes. Um, <laughs> But but then you're at another place where you're, you're continuing, Ali, to knock at the door, right? Where you're like right there, you're rubbing shoulders. You're, you're, you're certainly one of the fittest women in America. And it's very obvious with the consistency that you show up um, with season in and season out. And 
then you decide it's still it's I, I need I need more I need something different. What spurred then the mm-hmm. transition to the with Justin and the underdog crew? Yeah, and um, yeah, I think when my time with Nick was, uh, I learned so so much and really respect him as a coach and all the brew coaches and everything that they gave me. And uh, we really, you know, I'm on the smaller end of of the women's field. I I used to weigh like 130, 135 pounds, and so. It was pretty obvious, you know, especially even just looking back unbiased, like with 2017, there was no barbell that year. It's like a lot of heavyweight or heavy gymnastics and stuff. And so I I always knew that like I needed to be stronger. And that was like our main focus with Brute, especially it's very specialized programming and very um, dialed in like on the polar ends of training, you know, like you work on the strength and you work on the, you know, longer cardio type stuff. And so I think I definitely needed to do that and at the very least try to do that and just see what happened. Because I feel like I had in the back of my head, like, what if I just spent six months to try to get stronger? What if? And it was just like always nagging me for like a couple years and COVID happened and it was kind of like, well, like if we're ever going to do it, this is the perfect time because there's no competitions for the foreseeable future. And so like, I don't really have to stay fit. Um, Whereas if you're competing every year, you kind of like, you can't ever really get that out of shape. So we spent a lot of time, I really upped my calories, I really upped my strength volume, and I was able to put on almost 10 pounds. Um, It was more so probably across the span of a year than six months, but um, really, really emphasized the strength training. And you know what? I didn't get that much stronger. Like I I did get stronger, but it was like, you know, I'm not going to even if I only did powerlifting, I'm not going to be as big and strong as, as the biggest and strongest girls at the CrossFit games. But I was able to keep on the weight and, you know, the initial like weight gain, you definitely feel like differences in your body weight movements, your cardio, your stuff like that. But after like an adjustment period, I felt like just as good as I was before. And I don't know how to describe it other than like, I just felt more durable. Like I just felt like I could withstand more training volume and I wasn't necessarily like, Whoa, I definitely got way stronger, like PR by 20 pounds on everything. And like can cycle a barbell, like nothing now, but I just felt like I needed that time to like a try it and be like, okay, that wasn't like this secret formula that I had kind of um, this question mark in my head. And I did make significant improvements there it's hard in our sport because it's the test is always changing and there's not many, uh, you know, of course you can like benchmark your PRs on your lifts and stuff, but it's not as clear as like, okay, I'm definitely getting better because of I placed better this year. It's like, there's a thousand variables that (laughs) that go into that, that you could be better, but not place better. 100%. And I, and I think you bring up a lot of things, right? It's like, there's, what we're starting to understand with with CrossFit is that we really feel as though, or historically we felt as though, hey, Allie, you need to get stronger. Cool. All we're going to do is strength stuff with you, right? But it's important to help keep your strengths, your strengths as well. And I don't mean literal yeah. strength. I mean, hey, your gymnastics biased yeah. by nature and by mm-hmm. athletic background, we've still got to actually keep you sharp there. So mm-hmm. when there's an event that we can go get a first place with, we're going to get a hundred points, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing with cardiovascularly. Um, while we do want athletes to continue to gain strength and optimally as quickly as possible, there's a point of diminished returns where we see such a drop off in other things or, and you know this too, even if physiologically we don't see a drop off in you, Ali, as an athlete, if you don't have the confidence to perform on that point of fatigue and you just mm-hmm. feel out of shape, That's such a dangerous spot for a lot of athletes Mm -hmm. to be in. I can't, I can't tell you how many times athletes I've trained over the years are like, coach, I feel out of shape. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand. Like physiologically, you haven't suffered in two days. I know, (laughs) (laughs) but just relax. Like you'll be fine. (laughs) Of course. And they do. There's, we, we attract a particular type of person, right. In the sport that enjoys the suffering and enjoys the, all the wonderful things that come with, uh, doing hard things. Um, but it's, it's always interesting to have that type of programming philosophy chatter with athletes Mm -hmm. or coaches, because everybody's got different beliefs and systems. Um, but we see so many different things work over time. But what we do know is that 
strength does take time to build. And that is where you had found yourself for several years. Yeah. And so even as you say that you leaned into strength training for those months, you learned that it did make you more durable. You did feel that you potentially had more resiliency toward high, towards higher volumes because you had mm -hmm. a greater a greater body weight, even though you weren't like, hey, yeah, cool. I'm knocking down 20 pound PRs all the time. Yeah. The juice was worth the squeeze in that instance for you. Mm -hmm. For sure. And then how how did you find yourself rebuilding back your your, your <laughs> gymnastics and your conditioning with it? I mean, it it wasn't – it didn't feel like it was that stark of like, okay, now we're switching back to like CrossFit. It was more of like a gradual thing. And, um, you know, then competitions started uh, coming back. And it was, I think that after COVID, yeah, the, the, the main thing was just like semifinals last year. And um, I felt like I had a, a really good semifinals. Like I was, I had grown so much in the previous years and like before COVID too, I had hit a few sanctionals and, um, it with every one of those, you know, comes tons of learning experiences and opportunities, but I just kind of felt like I needed to be better at CrossFit. <laughs> and, um, and I, I don't know what the best method for that is, but I didn't feel like I was doing, did I get frozen? No, you're good. No. Okay. Um, I didn't feel like I was doing much CrossFit. And so yep. like in my training, and so I felt like I needed to do a little bit more CrossFit. And of course there's a time and a place for, you know, the, you know, strength work and, and the just monostructural work, but I felt across the board. Yeah. I have a few weaknesses here and there, but none of them were so glaring. That's like, Oh, I clearly just need to like work on this one movement. Like I just felt like I needed to be fitter all around. And, um, during COVID last, uh, last year, I was just kind of training all alone, um, in my garage gym and was, you know, I, I kind of thrive in that community environment and just the, f the fun aspect of training too. It's been, eight years now. And I just love that, uh, competitive environment. And so I was friends with Bethany Shadburn and, um, I knew that she was out here with Justin Kotler and, and the whole crew. And I was like, Hey, can I just come out to train with you guys for, um, just kind of bored here in my gym. And literally the first night I was like, I have to move here. Like I came out with no intentions of, of moving out and it just felt so right. Like the, uplifting environment, the competitive atmosphere, just getting crushed by Carrie and, and Bethany by like six minutes in a workout. I was like, yeah, I need this. <laughs> and um, so it, it happened super organically all, as well. Um, I just kind of found them and then um, continued throughout the season, happened to come out here um, for my semifinal and got to spend a little bit more time with them. And I was still with Nick at the time, obviously, and we, we finished through uh, semifinals. And I felt like I, like I said, I had a great semifinals. And then it was just like, I know that I'm going to, I have to move out here to just kind of try again. It was very similar to that strength thing. Like I had this thing in the back of my head that like, you need to be in an environment where like you're getting pushed and beaten like every day, because mm -hmm. that's how you're going to be able to like, um, just get closer to my potential and, and improve. I, I felt like the best. So that's how that happened. I love that. And I think that's amazing. It speaks, it speaks volumes to your, to your personal perspective on what success entails. Right. And, it, and it's really about being humbled and being willing to eat that humble pie and, and knowing that you're going to become better because of that. I'll tell you what, that's mm -hmm. not, you know, as you might think, um, as I once thought that was the common trait of an athlete. It certainly isn't right. Like yeah. a lot of people yeah. need to be top dog in order to have yeah. their confidence in, in that. So mm -hmm. my next question is just about the dynamic that you guys have. I know it's very, extremely competitive. You can walk away with be the victor on an AM workout and then get your butt kicked in the PM yeah. workout. How, how is, do you believe that that's going to create a, a different, a different alley on the floor this year when you show up at semifinals? I think just, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of benefits from it. I think, you know, the day in and day out of training, like, and this, I kind of uh, said this to myself, like before I moved out here is like, even if I didn't get better at all physically, which like I knew I was going to, but even if I didn't, it would just be like the experience would make it worth, worth it for me rather yep. than being all alone in my garage gym, like beating my head into the wall, just like suffering every day. And like, there, I think there's, 
sometimes when when that is beneficial and like I I like that sometimes but like for you know six hours a day uh you know five or six days a week like it just I I just th- I know that I thrive more in that community environment so I knew that bottom line I would get more enjoyment out of it which then you know like makes you enjoy it more, which makes you better, which makes you do it for longer. So I just knew all of those were good things. Um, but I think, yeah, like there's, we have quite a few athletes out here and there's somebody here that's better than you at everything or better than me at everything I should say. And so like, even the things that I thought I was really good at, like the handstand, handstand walking and, you know, muscle ups or whatever it may be, like there's somebody here that can do it better than you. And so you don't, you have like no comfort, (laughs) you know, like there's somebody who can beat you in everything. And so it's just constantly pushing you and showing you, uh, what is possible because your competitors out at semifinals or at the games, there's going to be somebody better than you probably out there as well. And so getting you used to that and pushing yourself further, um, because you see what's possible, and um, that experience too, just getting to do a workout like next to people um, on a daily basis, even if they are super far ahead of you or super far behind you, like you just know that you have to still do the best that you can do and like maximize, like it doesn't matter if so-and-so is, if you're beating them by two minutes, like they're, you know, I try to imagine that there's, 29 other or 28 other women out there that like who knows where they did like so still pushing you and vice versa too like just because somebody's beating you by two minutes like they could be a complete outlier in that workout and like you still might have a badass time if you continue to push and so just like not giving up and and just experiencing that every day because I think that you know I've been competing a ton of I've competed so many times and you always get that experience but getting that little experience every day, I think just will make the competition floor that much more comfortable. And so this, it'll be like, yeah, this is just like training. There's some people ahead of me, there's some people behind me. And I know I got to stick to my plan and my strategy to maximize my points and do as best as I can do. Yeah. I think that's amazing. And, and really, again, the, the lessons that you're learning and the, the experiences that you're getting day in and day out, session to session there are, are, are adding up for you tremendously. I'm, I'm very sure of that. Um, when we think about this year's semifinals, we just watched, you know, three of them wrap. It's week one. I mean, I couldn't be more excited as like a commentator and having mm-hmm. the opportunity to discuss what's happening out on the floor this year. Um, how do you feel about the two workouts that at least we know we can anticipate at the Atlas mm-hmm. Games coming up in a few weeks? Yeah, I'm super excited. I mean, I love the legless rope climb one. I, I love that one. I love fast workouts. I love upper body pulling. So it's like yes and yes to that one. Um, the barbell complex is not my favorite, but there's always some sort of you know strength element. And I think that it's cool that it's a pretty complex, uh, complex, I guess. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and um, – And it's going to be fun. It's kind of the same thing. Like it's, I know I'm probably not going to win that event, but just how can I figure out to strategize and prepare? You know, we have so many weeks before the Atlas games. And so I've already done that a few times and I'm going to do it a few more times. So figuring out like what that line is for me, hoping to bank off a little bit of, you know, competition adrenaline and absolutely um, execute to my best ability so it's anytime you get to do a lift in a competition it's just it's so special because you know most of the time you're training you're tired you know you don't have that adrenaline that you have at a competition and so it is really such a treat to get to max out at a competition in front of a crowd like that I love it. And, and, and really, you know, you hit on a couple of cool things there. Um, one, you know, you're such a veteran. You've been to, to uh, uh, several regionals. You had the semifinal under your belt last year where you finished ninth. And again, you just find yourself right there. You're so close. When you think about the mentality and your mindset going into this year, coupled both with your experience and your desire to continue to advance throughout the season. What's your approach like, you know, when you take off to go to Montreal, I believe that's where we're going. When when you take off to go there, where's your mind and how do you kind of keep yourself with that fine balance of focus, but excited? Yeah. And that's something that I've definitely zeroed in on, especially with probably the last like three or four competitions that I've done. I had, I felt like I had a huge turning point when I did strength and depth. Um, 
and just really like letting go of the outcome. Like, of course I want to make it to the games. That's always been my goal. And that would, you know, mean so much to me to make it, but like myself as a person and as, as an athlete is not defined on whether I make it to the games or not. And so there's this sense of like, I don't really care. Um, but obviously I really care. And so being able to like focus on the things that are actually in my control. I feel really good with my preparation this year. I feel like I've honestly done every single thing that I could have, you know, I moved into like a better training environment and maximize my potential there. And for the last however many months, years have been putting in the training inside the gym, plus everything outside of the gym. I feel really confident in my ability to strategize workouts and go out there and execute to the best of my ability and I really just want to enjoy the experience and that all comes from within and doesn't have to do with the leaderboard and so just I think when you can zero in on those things that you actually have control on it it gives you that focus because you're like you're not wondering like oh what's going to happen and like if this happens x y and z like a million things like that and of course those things come into my head and um, but I just always find a way to come back to like, okay, what do I actually have control of and what can I do about it and maximize my potential out there. And one thing I've really been thinking about this year that it seems so simple, but um, for, for whatever reason, I was talking to Justin a few months ago, just talking about like, what do I, what I need to do to like break through to that next level. And, he was just kind of like we were talking, like just need to like maximize my points in every event. And like putting it that way, it just depersonalized it from all of the other competitors. It's like, and, and my training partners too, you know, like I don't have to beat anybody in anything. I just need to go out there and like get as many points as I can on every single event. And that for whatever reason, that for me was just like made it me so much more confident and like believe that I could actually do it too instead of being like, oh, I have to beat so-and-so or I have to do this. And of course, everybody's motivated by different things, but that just felt like so much more in my control that like, how can I go out there, prepare for these next few months and execute and rack up as many points as I possibly can? I really think that that is the key to great coaching. Right. Like yeah. that example that you gave of Justin, even explaining that to you, that conversation that he had with Danielle 10 minutes later could have been completely different. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, hey, she's out there. She's like, yeah, really, what's going to be successful for me is if I think about cutting everyone's head off or whatever it is. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. complete sarcasm. But mm -hmm. truly, we all have, we all wired differently. There's yeah. different ways that we're we're focused in we're geared and and i think that maximizing your points in every event mm -hmm. is such a wonderful focus and and again yeah. it does a tremendous uh having a tremendous ability to depersonalize the experience for you so that's mm -hmm. amazing i think with with you sharing that hey your mentality your mindset is going to be in a great place uh from the day that we actually find out the workouts that are to be yeah. and and from the moment you take the floor there in montreal uh, did you get a chance to watch many of the semifinals this week are you the type that's watching oh, an yeah, eager no, i'm or? such okay. a crossfit fan girl <laughs> um, and i also had a deload uh this weekend as well so it made it a little bit easier but i was like next weekend i gotta like <laughs> reel it in and like <laughs> schedule my watching time because I'd always be like well, looking at it and, um, but it's awesome I love watching the competition and there's so many amazing storylines uh Christy Aramo like getting like sweeping today like ah oh, we're we're good friends and that was just really cool and and super inspiring to see her do plus well more ad like yes and it just goes to show like and I think Christy has a very similar mindset too is just like you just got to go out there and do the best you can do and hope that that gives you the result that you were hoping for but again it's not you're not any less of a person if you don't get enough points at the end of the weekend <laughs> no and, and and remember you know the beauty of it all is that it's it's literally a test of six events it's not any one test yeah. you know and it's yeah. so much bigger than just one or two scores so i think mm -hmm. people always realizing that staying focused all the way through um and just literally fighting and clawing for every single point, no matter the placement. Yep. That's awesome. Well, Ali, what advice you got for me? Listen, I'm going to be a rookie. You're going to be taking the floor and you're going to be a veteran. I'm going to be a rookie on the microphone, commentating these heats, not knowing what to say other than the things that are going through my mind. And you watch some of these semifinals this weekend. What do you think? Are they, are they doing a good job covering it? What are they missing? What can I, what can I bring to the table? 
Hmm, that's a good question. What can you bring to the table? I think just, you know, getting to know the athletes like you're doing is is a great step, like first step, because I think that people want to hear those storylines that are just more casual fans, you know, may just be turning on on. They don't know that much about the athletes. And I think that's where, like, I think that's why I'm such a fan, because I, I know these people. I know Christy and I and I know Will. And it's just like, ah, like you're so excited for them because, you know, like the sacrifices and how hard they worked and how long they've been in the sport and what it means to them. And um, I think just telling that story is, is super important. And um, so, yeah, I think that's a, that's the best advice I got for you. Hey, I appreciate that. I will take it to heart and I'll be. And trusting. enjoy the experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to certainly do that. It, it'll certainly be a new one for me. Very different vibes. I'm going to do the best to bring my, experience as an athlete and coach uh, to the table, of course, when it comes to covering the individuals and teams. But I will first and foremost do, be, be taking the most notes that I can to kind of bring a personalized experience for the viewers and the listeners. So I appreciate that. But Ali, I appreciate more so your time. I know this is a tremendously busy time of year for you as an athlete and you are, you know, you've got some very exciting times ahead of you in the next couple of weeks. Um, unfortunately, since we're, we're not for a few weeks out, it's kind of like hurry up and wait at this point. Uh, yeah, um, sure. I kind of <laughs> like it though. I, re- I feel like most people I've talked to, they're like, I just want to go right away. And I know that myself, like I just, I get so much more confidence when I can gain this like momentum through my training and the train, my training's been so good. And then like, I took up this little deal this weekend and I'm like, all right, a couple more weeks of building and like, we're going to be there. So I'm excited for that. Awesome. Well, we wish you nothing but the best of luck. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Athlete to Athlete here on Rise and Pod. And I can't wait to see you in Montreal. Thanks, Adrian. I'll see you in Montreal. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, guys.